Okay. Great. Well, welcome everyone to the Susitna River Coalition's speaker event, uh, the inaugural speaker event of the 2021-2022 season. Before we get started, I would really like to thank the Chase Community Council, the Talkeetna Community Council, the Jessica Stevens Foundation, and all of the very generous individual donors that make events like this possible. My name is Margaret Stern, and I am the Communications and Outreach Coordinator for the Susitna River Coalition. Um, also on the screen from time to time will be Melissa Hewer, who is the Executive Director of the Susitna River Coalition. And we are here with Mark Masteller, who will be giving a talk on energy efficiency of your home. So you might recognize Mark from a few events that we held in the spring when he was running for re-election of the Matanuska board seat of the Matanuska Electric Association. He won his seat back and we are so excited that Mark is on our utility board and representing our community. Um, so Mark, in addition to being on the board of the Matanuska Electric Association, is also the, an assistant professor of sustainable energy at the University of Alaska Fairbanks Bristol Bay campus. And prior to that, he worked for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game based out of Palmer um, for quite a while. Um, and now he is pretty focused on sustainable, uh, on ecologically sustainable communities. And we are super excited that Mark is here today to give us a discussion about how to prep our homes for the upcoming cold months. So thank you, Mark, for being here. And I will pass the screen over to you. Okay, thanks a lot, Margaret, for the invitation. Uh, and yeah, tonight I'll be speaking from, from my position at the university, not as a board member tonight. So uh, just to be clear on which hat I'm wearing. <laughs> and uh, I think we talked about it for the people uh, joining us. I'll be sharing my screen. And if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. Um, I'm hoping to basically leave plenty of time for questions. I'll warn you, as I start to share my screen, I'll warn you that sometimes I go kind of fast and sometimes I slow down to hit other slides a little bit harder. So I'm about to hit the button here and looks like we're sharing and maybe Margaret, you can tell me if that looks like it's working. This looks great. Okay, so you're seeing my first slide, is that correct? Yes, we have your first slide on the screen. Thank you. Okay, good. Sounds like it's working then. All right. So like <laughs> I said, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go quickly through a few things to set the stage. But basically, I wanted to talk about the energy efficiency side of my world anyway. And uh, as Margaret said, I work for the university. I work for the, US, for the Bristol Bay campus in Dillingham, but I live in Palmer. And the, the goals of our program are, the, the basic goals of our program are basically energy literacy, understanding where our energy comes from, how we use it, et cetera. And then that's all part of, you know, preparing students of all ages. We get people from basically 16 to, I had a guy who was 80 some not too long ago, to, to help in this whole clean energy transition. That's the goals of our of our program. And I always like to also kind of from a semantic point of view, talk about the word sustainable energy because there's really two parts to that. Um, energy efficiency, which is the demand side of our energy side of our world and renewable energy. And to be quite frank, lots of people love to talk about renewable energy. I was really thrilled to get invited to talk about efficiency because it's actually far more important. <laughs> well, it's, it's super important when it comes to this world. So the sustainable energy term captures both of those things, efficiency and renewables. And efficiency is critical if you wanna get to a world of the renewables. You'll probably hear me say that again. So why, why do we talk about this? In my world or my view, Energy is connected to everything else we do. Gathering food, healthy communities, you see them right there. Energy is underlying all of that stuff. 
So it's just critical to our world and our worldview. Why? Another reason, of course, climate change. We know that using fossil energy is what's driving climate change, right? So uh, that's what we're trying to transition away from in a, in a manner that is, is uh, reasonable, right? So we know a, a lot of you, I don't know where everybody is around here, but everybody in Alaska is seeing impacts from climate change and the climate's changing faster in the northern latitudes than it does say near the equator. We also have another big vulnerability in our state related to how closely tied we are to an industry that has a roller coaster for its, uh, its trends. And that's not a, that's, that's a risky situation from a perspective of, of an economic situation for our state. So we, as we transition away from fossil energy, we get to a situation that is less like a roller coaster. One of the biggest reasons though that I do this work is we have the highest energy costs in the nation and rural Alaskans, some of them have the highest, even higher than, I mean, way higher than Anchorage and Fairbanks, et cetera. But some Alaskans are spending up to almost half their income on energy bills. And this is a critical situation in lots of parts of our state. So tonight I wanted to kind of run through, this is just the outline for what we'll talk about. And uh, I'll, like I say, I'll run through some of that pretty quickly. I'm gonna be watching the clock so I don't run over. And I hope that we capture any questions in the chat or we'll have time at the end, but we're gonna talk about how we use energy very briefly. We're gonna talk about some more semantic kind of terminology stuff. And then we'll get into the meat of reducing our energy use in the home situation anyway. And then briefly talk about how we connect efficiency with uh, with renewable energy systems. <clears throat> so first thing, in our homes, um, there's really three categories of energy use that we generally talk about. Heating, electricity, and domestic hot water. And usually when I'm like starting one of my classes, I'll ask people, how do you use energy? And people will start to you know, lump their energy use into, they say, well, I turn computers on or I charge my phone or I turn lights on or I heat my house or whatever. And it's usually the people pretty quickly figure out you know, the heating and the electricity. I usually have to draw the domestic hot water out of people. I have to say, well, wait, did you take a shower recently and was it a warm shower? But you can see the ranges of the uh, energy that we need for each of these three activities. And clearly what we call space conditioning, heating and cooling is the largest chunk when it comes to energy units. A lot of times we talk a lot about electricity but heating is, and cooling is really the biggest one. And I didn't used to say cooling too much because we don't do a lot of cooling in Alaska but we're doing a lot more than we used to. Heating and cooling, so space conditioning. So you can see the general ranges there and we'll talk about each, each of those. Let's see if I can. Okay, so another semantic thing really quickly. In the energy efficiency world, we really have two components to that uh, term. We kind of roll the terms of conservation and efficiency into the term energy efficiency. Typically, it's kind of what happens in our brains, but they're, they're clearly different things. Conservation actions is basically ways to not use energy. So I ride my bike instead of I drive my car, or I, um, uh, I, I walk or I, uh, um, I figure out a different way to not use energy units. Whereas efficiency, the, the efficiency side, again, from a semantic perspective is I'm gonna have to use that energy, right? I gotta have lights but I'm gonna do it as efficiently as I can. And so it typically involves a technological um, uh, improvement or advancement or whatever. The conservation side, a lot of that has to do with behavior. As a result, conservation actions are often, they can be no cost actions, but it's pretty hard sometimes to change behavior. But keep those two things in mind as we go forward. So reducing energy use. No cost action. Again, as I mentioned, uh, related to behavior, uh, 
And this covers all types of those, you know, just some examples of all types of uh, uh, energy use. Lower your thermostat, you know, keep it at a range that's a little bit lower. Shorten your showers. Turn off lights when, when you're not needing them. Kill phantom loads. I'll say right now, people who live off grid, they do all this stuff like automatically. It's only for those of us who live in the areas where energy tends to be cheaper that we tend to like waste more energy. There's lots of data out there that the higher your energy costs, the more conscious you are of what's going on. So some general actions. We love this term, no measurement, no management. In other words, if you start measuring your energy use, you can then take some action to change it. And I'll just go through a few examples of how we can do that when it comes to this measurement and management situation for, for any kind of energy you wanna talk about. Utility bills. Now, I don't know where everybody lives, but these are two examples of uh, utility bills in my part of the world. So an electric bill and a, and a natural gas bill. You can't see any of that, right? Here's some details. And I don't really have a pointer, but in the middle of the screen is, I think, I don't know if my pointer does anything here. No, I don't see it working. Okay, so in the middle of the screen, you can see that in this particular month, uh, the charge was for 169 kilowatt hours. And you can see what the rate is. It's 12 cents for the first step, but that's not all. You're not just paying 12 cents a kilowatt hour. You're also paying the COPA, which is the adjustment for your fuel. In this case, natural gas is what we use mostly to burn, to make our electricity. So you've got another seven cents a kilowatt hour added onto that. So now you're getting close to 20 cents a kilowatt hour, which is, this is an MEA bill. And this is, uh, that's about the lowest on the rail belt from Homer to Fairbanks, either the lowest or second to lowest, depending. So just keep in mind though, what I wanna get across is that you wanna think about units, okay? Energy units. So kilowatt hours for electricity and, whoops, I'm not going, let's do this. Oh, there we go. And then, whoops. And then uh, notice that typically your bill is also gonna have some sort of a, a usage history on it. So this is a nice annual view of what's going on. And it's gonna be diff different for everybody, but most of us are gonna use more electricity in the winter than we do in the summer, et cetera. But these are, and, and uh, we can't get into it now, but right now there's two, there's two bars on each one of these because in, in my particular case, we have a solar electric system that is contributing to this. But you'll, you'll get the idea. Natural gas very similar. Again, you're going to have a flat customer charge, a monthly charge every month that doesn't matter how many, in this case, CCFs you use. And the same would be true for your electric bill. There's a flat charge. You can't change that. And then you're going to get charged per unit of energy. But what I'm trying to get across is get to know those units of energy. Same thing with your natural gas bills. You've got a little bit of a history. In this case, they usually put the temperature on there relative to the number of CCFs you use, that's 100 cubic feet. And as you might expect, the lower the temperature, the more you use natural gas to heat your house. What about if you're not using natural gas? Gets a little harder. Lots of people in our area don't have natural gas. So they might have heating oil or propane or wood. And now you gotta be thinking more about the units of those things. You don't get a regular bill for heating oil. Your propane tank only gets filled up whenever you need it. And you might be out there chopping wood or measuring it or buying wood by the court. So that takes a lot more work to uh, keep track of, right? And this is something when we talk about no measurement, no management, you're gonna be starting to keep track very closely of your energy units so that you know what impacts it is when you make a change. So bottom line on utility bills, get to know the units and the use so that you can evaluate the effectiveness of your actions, all right? So let's talk about space heating. And I, like I say, sometimes I feel like I go fast, but, uh, and, and Margaret can break in if there's anything, but uh, any problems, but, Okay, so 
space heating. I'm not gonna talk about cooling too much. We'll still stick with heating. We know in general that, you know, whenever we try to heat the inside of a building, heat moves towards cold. We have a lot of months of the year in Alaska where the cold is strong and outside. So our heat wants to move outside. And these are just some general numbers about how our building envelope loses heat uh, or your transfer of heat. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of things you can do to try to change that heat loss. And from a heating perspective, one of the low cost options is simply gaps and cracks. So in the, in the building science world, we would talk about this as air sealing. We're trying to keep your energy dollars inside the home by not going out through gaps and cracks. Now, to be quite honest, when energy was dirt cheap, we built places that had lots of air leakage and we didn't really care because all you did is turn the thermostat up and it wasn't that much money, but now that world is gone, right? And we don't want to be heating up the outside. So there are some really easy things you can do. Caulk and foam gaps and cracks. You can also think about a setback therm thermostat, again, as a low cost option, which means at night it's going to turn your heating system down a little more and then it'll wake up when you program it in the morning to heat the, the place up a little more. And also uh, one that often gets forgotten, or at least uh, it's easy to maybe put off, is just a heating system tune-up so that your whatever heating system you have is functioning at the best efficiency it, it can. So those are some low cost options. Always have to throw this in. If you start to tighten up your building envelope, which we encourage, you can get to the point where the inside air quality, indoor air quality is, can be toxic. You know, we don't want people to get hurt by mold and all sorts of bad things. So now, instead of like, now that we've learned how to build envelopes a lot tighter, we have to mechanically ventilate our homes. So I always throw this in there. If you're gonna tighten up the building envelope, you gotta know that at some point you need mechanical ventilation. We call that a heat recovery ventilator. HRV is the term you'll hear a lot. So uh, most new homes are built with an HRV, but a lot of homes in Alaska don't have them and they don't honestly need them until they get tightened up. So this is something later on when we talk about an energy audit that your energy audit will tell you if you get to the point where you need an, an HRV. But it's critical because you can die from black mold and things like that. We don't want unhealthy situations. So we want you to save energy and stay healthy. When it comes to reducing heat loss, one of the best things you can do is get an, uh, what we call a home energy audit. Now, this is a point in time where if I could see everybody, I'd say, anybody had this done? Unfortunately, I can't see anybody. <laughs> so, um, but energy audits are not that uncommon anymore. And uh, it's, a, it's well worth your dollars. And I would say an energy audit could run about $500 if you're on the road system. They used to be cheaper than that. I don't know exactly know what the latest prices are, but getting an energy audit on your home is a really good way to know what your best measures are to save money and save energy. Because that energy auditor is going to come in and do some analysis. This is a fancy picture showing, you know, both an infrared image plus the blower door. The blower door is there on the on the door. And this, what your audit is going to give you is a list of things you can do and their cost effectiveness. In other words, if you put your money here, your return on investment is the best for item number one and, and the worst for item number 12. And return on investment is a really important thing to know. So as a matter of fact, windows typically are pretty low on the list, even though a lot of people say, oh, I need new windows. Windows are very expensive and therefore, from a cost perspective, they don't rate very high. Whereas other actions, which I'll show you in a second, other actions get a more immediate payback. But the point I wanna make is this type of a report is really good information for you to know what steps are best from a heating loss perspective. And most energy audits are dealing mostly with heating loss. 
<clears throat> so here's here's some data when we had years of uh, uh, what we call the home energy rebate program and the weatherization program, there was some reports written on the effectiveness of those programs. <clears throat> and generally, getting a more efficient heating system is the most effective thing people can do to save energy. But it's not necessarily cheap. I mean, new heating systems can cost a lot of money. But that's from a perspective of, you know, looking at all the data, that was one of the most efficient things that people could do. So if you've got an old heating system that's like 80% efficient, you might think about the fact that they make heating systems that are 95% efficient now. And then you start to do the, you start to do the numbers to see how does that pencil out for you? And once you learn how to make that calculation, pretty simple back of the envelope calculation, you can do it for LED bulbs or you can do it for a heating system. You could say, well, wait a minute, I'm going to save X amount per year. I might spend $12,000, but I'm going to save $1,500 a year. And that's a pretty quick payback in energy bills. So heating systems were number one, sealing air leaks, very low cost thing. That Just that action averaged a 14% decline in heat loss. That's a pretty good thing for a pretty simple thing to do insulation walls and doors you can see the list there but this is the kind of uh information you're going to get from an energy audit here's a little bit of data i just thought i'd throw it out there but uh notice in the red really is the important part people who went through this process and spent money to make their home better the average fuel savings or decline in fuel use was 33% and the average savings in dollars was 26% decrease. Now a quarter, if you can reduce your cost by a quarter, that's quite a bit. And then you can see the CO2 there as well. So I strongly recommend energy audits. You can find auditors, all, I think I'll tell you here in a bit. Okay, so electricity. This is the one that's typically a little bit easier for us to get a handle on, for us to do something about. Uh, less, less expensive in lots of ways. Now, one thing we know is over time, lots of our stuff, you know, TVs, freezers, whatever, has gotten more efficient. That's, that's partly the industry getting more efficient. Partly that's because some of the rules that they have to get more efficient. But we also tend over time to plug more stuff in or we get the bigger TV. So, you got to think about how that all affects your electricity use. You know, do you really need that extra seven inches in a new TV or whatever? But just awareness is what we're going after. Appliances and lighting, like I said, a lot of things are getting more energy efficient. And it's pretty easy in some cases to know the energy consumption of your, of your devices. Light bulbs is pretty easy to do the... Uh, to do the math on those. And, you know, we used to talk, I used to talk about, uh, definitely you wanna throw away any incandescent bulb, but I used to talk about uh, compact fluorescent bulbs too, but to be honest, go with LEDs. Prices have come down, energy, energy use is better in an LED than a, than a compact fluorescent. When you get a chance, just get rid of compact fluorescents and, L and incandescence and incandescence you should throw away before they're into the useful life they're they don't last a long time anyway but they produce an awful lot of heat and not a lot of light and then of course you've probably all seen the uh, uh, energy guides on most appliances now that'll tell you how much energy that appliance uses so if you have to upgrade an appliance you want to be looking for that yellow label to see what's the uh energy use in a year, not the dollar amount, because the dollar amount is based on 11 cent electricity in some place like, you know, Phoenix. But you want to look at the energy units, and that's at the bottom of that yellow guide. So if it says you're going to use about 630 kilowatt hours a year, that's the number you want to be thinking about. You don't have to use it that much, but that's what it's going to tell you is the average American. Phantom loads, huge thing easy to deal with. Um, this is electricity use when a device says it's off. And unfortunately, lots of our devices now 
go into this kind of sleep mode instead of really off. And anything with a remote, like your TVs and even radios now have remotes and lots of things have remotes. Those have phantom loads. You might think, well, it's not that big a deal. Some devices can up to have a phantom load of up to 50%. I can show you that by measuring it. But if you look at the averages, it's like 15%. Well, if I can save 15% with a really cheap uh, power strip, do it. The key is with a power strip, you got to use the power strip. In other words, plug your TV and your DVD player and all that into the same power strip, but turn that thing, turn them all off when you're not using them. It's one thing to plug them into the power strips, but you got to use the power strips. Phantom loads can be significant, but they're relatively easy to deal with. <clears throat> if you want to get a little fancier, uh, they have lots of devices out there, and this is not an advertisement for any one particular one. Um, they have lots of devices now that you can put into your distribution panel. So that top picture is an electrical distribution panel, and you can put these monitors in there, and these devices will then start to learn each of the circuits in your home. So pretty soon, and it'll give you a little you know, visual uh, a report that says, okay, your refrigerator ran this many uh, hours, or your, it, it, it learns to sense the different uh, circuits and the different devices in your home. Now you can say, gosh, I've got some data. This thing's telling me this thing runs this much and my water pump runs that much and all that. These things sense the, uh, sense the different circuits. This is a little more expensive, but if you're really into good data and how to change your electric bill, these things are well worth it. So, and they make, you know, there's many different brand names and they all have a, like a similar principle. Typically they're gonna, you know, put something in your distribution panel and it's gonna uh, connect to a, typically a wireless, device that then you can monitor with a computer or uh, like a smartphone. Reducing electricity use is generally one of the easier things you can do. Now, in a lot of cases, your electric bill is not the biggest bill you have. It's like I said earlier, it's probably your space heating bill, but it depends on everybody's situation is different. But I've seen, I've seen uh, many situations where just with awareness, people can reduce their electric bill by 40% and more. And that's a pretty good deal, you know? And the, uh, the, you're never gonna get away from that like monthly fee that we all need to pay to help keep the grid healthy, the grid that we use, we all use, but you can get away from the kilowatt hour charges by using energy just when you need it. And by the way, these, these dramatic reductions of greater than 40%, not no change in quality of life. You don't have to change the, what you're doing. You just have to be aware that if you're not in that room, there doesn't need to be lights on in that room. That kind of thing, right? <clears throat> or if you're you're going to upgrade your refrigerator, you get one that's more energy efficient, and you are conscious about how that how that works. Domestic hot water. So this is the one that a lot of people don't think about, but obviously it takes energy to make that water hot. And anything you can do then to reduce the, um, the demand of domestic hot water is energy savings into your pocket. So shorter showers, wash clothes in cold water, you can probably think of lots of things, low flow shower heads or low flow fixtures, you know, for both uh, the sinks and the shower, et cetera. <clears throat> so there's both conservation actions and efficiency actions. Also, you know, you're, lots of people's water heaters are set too high. Number one, it's kind of dangerous for children to, they can get scalded if it's more than 120. So uh, you want to, typically you want your domestic hot water heater to be at 120 degrees. And you, you kind of want to know what's making your hot water as well. Uh, is it an electric hot water heater? Is it run from your boiler? Is it run you know, what's the fuel being used to make your hot water? That's, a, that's part of the awareness thing as well. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, if you want to get an energy audit on the house, Alaska Housing Finance Corporation has a list of approved energy auditors. A lot harder to get one in rural Alaska than there is 
in urban Alaska, um, but uh, uh, they are out there. And since some of the programs have gone away, uh, the number has come down, but people are still out there. They can do energy audits. And also that book, I'm gonna hold this up. Hopefully you can see it. But this is a free publication um, available through the Alaska Energy Authority and Alaska Housing Finance Corporation with a lot of tips for saving energy as well. We use it in our home energy basics class. Now, if you wanna get a little bit more radical or a lot more radical, depending on what you're thinking, you know, you can, you can radically improve your structure. So a retrofit, which is a lot more uh, work and typically more money, but can result in lots of savings. Uh, you know, there's a lot more we could talk about if we talked about home energy retrofits. Is it an interior retrofit? Is it an exterior retrofit? How to do that, et cetera. We have a whole uh, a research center in Fairbanks called the Cold Climate Housing Research Center that has lots and lots of resources uh, to uh, help any of us out on that. But I'll just say like this particular little log cabin, you know, they wanted, they wanted the logs to be visible on the inside. So log cabins typically, unfortunately, aren't very energy efficient. Wood has got an R value of one, not very good. They look good, right? So these folks made the decision they're going to make a much better blanket around this house, little, little place in Fairbanks, and uh, add cellulose insulation, recycled material. And they had, they had the look of the uh, log on the inside, but they had a different out outside and they reduced the demand, energy demand of this place by 90%. And in, a, in an aggressive retrofit, that's not unusual. So that's pretty exciting if you think, well, I could reduce my heating bill by 90%. But of course, you've got to look at the costs and the benefits, et cetera. The higher your energy costs, the quicker your payback, right? So, as I hinted at at the very beginning, you know, we, a lot of us want to get to a world that's run on clean energy. And unfortunately, a lot of us tend to forget the efficiency side, but the, the, the way to enable the transition to a renewable energy world has got to go through the efficiency first road, right? Once we reduce that demand, it's a lot easier to, to get the energy we need for heating and electricity and domestic hot water. It's a lot easier to get that from renewable energy if we've reduced the demand. So always think efficiency first. Or when you're talking to a policymaker, because everybody wants to build something. We always want to build solar and we want to build wind or whatever. You could say to your policymaker, wait a minute, it's actually way more cost effective. So it pays back quicker to do the efficiency first. But it's just not sexy. So we have a problem in our industry trying to make people really remember, do the efficiency mechanisms first. Okay, so we have a whole program uh, at our campus. We have something called an occupational endorsement certificate. I'm not gonna go into detail on our program, but I wanna let everybody know you're always welcome. And uh, in fact, I have a, let's see, introduction to sustainable energy class is starting tomorrow. And on Wednesday, I start a solar class, but we have classes on all this kind of stuff. In the spring, we do something called the Alaska Utility Lecture Series which is talking about electric utilities across the state. It's mostly guest speakers. So if anybody wants any information about classes, don't be shy about asking me. And then, you know, this is where, this is kind of how I try to frame things. This is where I think, you know, we need to go. Now, of course, my bias is the energy side. You could take the energy term out of there. We still want sustainable use of local renewable resources, but I think it's going to require to get to what we call sustainable, resilient communities. It's going to require use of energy from sustainable use of local renewable resources. As I said earlier, the best way to get there is do the efficiency mechanisms first. Save your money. In other words, whether you're using fossil energy or clean energy, you're going to save money if you do the efficiency things first. So I always like, I love this slide, you know, this kind of transition from the gray world to the great green world. And uh, 
this is a good spot for me to stop and say, does anybody have questions? And, I, and, and Margaret, maybe you can help me out or Melissa, I can stop sharing and we can just look at everybody's face or what, what, or I can, if I need to go back to a slide, I can do that, but I'll stop for a second and get some input. Um, I think if you wanted to stop sharing and show us your face again, and we can, um, we have uh, some questions for okay. you, that would be great. Very good. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, thanks. Oh, um, that's good. Mark. Yeah, that was great. Um, there All right. Were... So, yeah, if anybody, yeah, go ahead, Margaret. Oh, sorry. Um, so, one of the first questions that we had was, are those electric monitors available to borrow anywhere? Where might someone get them? You know, it's a great question because some smaller units that a brand name is a kilowatt meter. Okay. So, those are, the kilowatt meter is, I should grab one, I probably have one around here. Um, it's something you can plug a device into and it'll tell you the consumption of that device, like a toaster or your microwave or whatever. Actually, a lot of libraries have those. So some of them are available to borrow. Now, the bigger ones, like when I talked about that meter that you put in your distribution panel, I've never seen one of those as a loaner, but it's not a bad idea. But typically what happens is the, the energy nerds put those in their houses because they're really something and they're going to be tracking it for the rest of their lives. But uh, kilowatt meters are, you know, 20 or 22 dollars and they're well worth it. Uh, you used to be able to buy them at Lowe's. I, I assume you still can. OK, great. Um, so we have a question from Kathleen who says, I'm off grid. Are there efficiency improvements in solar panels that would prompt me to replace my 20 year old panels? And what's new in storage systems? Have lead acid I have lead acid batteries that are due to be replaced. Oh, those are great questions. So uh, the new solar panels are definitely more efficient. Uh, typically you lose, you know, some percentage every year in solar and the technology has gotten better. And, um, it's kind of a matter of if your system's working, you know, you have to kind of do the numbers as to the investment you want to make in a new system and how long that's going to last. So I've seen lots and lots of solar panels that are that old and still working fine. They just lose a little bit every year. So they've, they've decreased. There's no doubt about it. And then you have to kind of just decide, am I going to upgrade or not? So that's not the greatest answer, but the efficiency of the new panels is definitely higher. And the, all the rage nowadays is bifacial panels, which produce energy on both sides of the panel. And they need to be mounted a lot differently or they can be mounted differently. So we're just kind of learning about that. But right now, bifacial panels are like some of the cheapest you can get because they weren't subject to some of the tariffs. So without getting too far into the solar panel weeds, definitely they're more efficient now. You got to do some math to figure out if it's worth it. Now, when it comes to batteries, lots and lots of changes in battery technology. I would say lead acid are still the most being sold, but other systems are being used like lithium ion, et cetera, in, in utility scale situations. And I actually have stayed away from a class on batteries because it's changing so quickly. Mm -hmm. So I tell people, if, you're, if you've got questions about batteries, it's really good to talk to different you know, renewable energy vendors and when I talk to them, they pretty much say, we're still mostly selling lead acid batteries, but we keep seeing the, you know, the cost curves of lithium ion batteries coming down. And it'll get to a point just like with solar that when that cost gets down enough, we'll be switching to lithium ion or something else. Interesting. Yeah, that sh the, the battery shift has been interesting. We just replaced our system at our off-grid cabin and, and we waited a while because the technology is changing so quickly. It's just. <laughs> so, but what did you pick? Did you pick lead acid? No, we didn't pick lead acid. Uh, we switched to lithium. All right. ion. Yeah. Pretty Good deal. Exciting. Yeah. Mark, are the bifacial um, panels used in some of the larger scale? I haven't seen though. I mean, I've seen some of the bigger productions being 
put in around on the grid. I haven't seen any. Of the, I haven't seen anything with bifacial. It seems like that would be a total game changer. Can you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, the biggest system in rural Alaska, 500 plus kilowatts in Kotzebue. Um, they just built it last summer, and you know they had planned to be monofacial panels, so they had a certain tilt angle they wanted, and they ordered their panels, and they got bifacial panels because they were the cheapest. And they, they couldn't change their design, so they just mounted them that way. But yeah, the biggest system in rural Alaska is a bifacial system. And now they will get, you know, in Kotzebue in the summer, especially the sun's kind of going around, right? It's not, uh, we're at 66 degrees up there. So yes, many folks are using bifacial and most of the applications I've seen so far, they keep, they use the same system orientation and tilt angle as we do for regular panels. Now there's research going on from the Alaska Center for Energy and Power in Fairbanks as to how can we maybe do better with bifacial. And one of the issues is it's a whole different mindset as to how to mount them. So now your orientation of your array is gonna be north south instead of east west. And you want those panels vertical. But one nice thing about bifacial is their power curve matches when we want power better than a regular panel. So it means you could use less storage if you're using storage like batteries. So there's a lot changing there, but to, uh, the short answer is many people are using bifacial, but so far we're usually mounting in the same way we did with the other panels and we get some more energy from behind when we get it, like uh, reflection off snow or if the sun comes around. Long answer to a short question, sorry, Melissa. No, that's great. Thank you. It's really interesting. It was great to see. I just got to see that 500 plus kilowatt thing in, in Kotzebue. It was really neat to, to see that system. Oh, I see Kathy mentioned the library has something to check out there. Oh, there's a question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I'll jump into some of these questions if you want me to, uh, Margaret. Okay. Yes. Go for it. If you see them. Well, let's see, triple pane, uh, the question, oh, this is Melissa. Uh, is it worth investing in an on-demand for savings versus, uh, whoops, I got to scroll. Sorry, that was in regards to someone who was asking if it was worth investing in an on-demand system um, for hot water instead of just cutting back, is there? Um, typically, the answer, typically, the answer is yes, but it always depends on the price, you know, if you can cut back and, and uh, uh, it's, it's, it's important, I think, to do the math and try to figure out if I cut back, what's that going to save me versus investing in the on-demand and how long that's going to last. Lots of times on-demand systems are definitely worth the investment. Um, are triple pane windows needed in Alaska? The answer is absolutely. They are needed in Alaska and uh, they're used quite a bit now in, in uh, more efficient, in like the most efficient homes I know, they don't have any double pane, right? They're triple pane. Um, there's a place in Fairbanks that makes the best windows probably in the state, but right now it's hard to get them because of the whole supply chain because of COVID. But uh, windows and doors, are one of the biggest problems in our envelope because the seals around them are difficult. So you look for multiple locking points and both of those things, if you start to get triple pane and multiple locking points, you tend to get pretty expensive. But as far as comfort, good windows are really comfortable. So I've had lots of people tell me, I know the numbers don't necessarily pencil out, pencil out that well, but the comfort level is huge. And that's a big deal for a lot of folks, yeah. Okay, let's see, emerging technologies I'm excited about. Uh, I guess, is that Carl? Um, you know, I, I tend to be a kind of person that, I believe we have a lot of the technology we need. We just don't have the will to make the change. So although I do get excited about some emerging technologies and uh, for me, like distributed electric, electrical generation and also beneficial electrification, like changing our transportation and our heating to electricity, that does excite me. 
But I tend to be one of those people that says, no, let's use the existing technology. Let's just use more of it rather than waiting for another silver bullet. It's more the silver buckshot uh, viewpoint. But I do, like if you build a really good house, you can heat it with a heat pump, an air source heat pump. You can get the heat out of the air. And I like heat pumps. And a lot of people would say they don't really, they're not meant for Alaska, but we have many, pl several places in Alaska that are using them effectively if the home is built to reduce energy demand. That's the key right there. Okay. I see one about opening a window. Ventilation for off-grid places. I think uh, even an off-grid place can have mechanical ventilation and it's a, you know, you can get a, a heat hey, wait, recovery Mark? ventilator. I'm Mark, sorry, sorry just, just because this is being recorded and not everyone can see the chat, can you just repeat the question before sure. you answer it? Sorry, sure. thanks. Uh, besides opening a window and putting in a PVC pipe in wall with fine screen on it to let in air, do you have any recommendations for ventilation for off-grid places? I plan on good insulation windows, but want as much info as I can get. I think even an off-grid place, which is going to have typically battery storage for your electricity, I think you need, if you have a very tight envelope, which I hope you do, you should have a heat recovery ventilator. And then you're going to be looking at that heat recovery ventilator and say, what's the, what's the energy draw on that? So that's part of your, going to be part of your energy load calculations. But it needs to be there. there and, and putting a pipe in is a really bad idea. Because if you build a really good envelope with good windows and doors, and then you put that pipe in there, you have negated everything else you spent money on. So you want something that controls your ventilation. I don't so, see other questions. As a question, a question I have is: as our summers are getting warmer, is there do we need to make any changes to our buildings or buildings that are being built to, to new construction to accommodate for that shift in our climate? Absolutely. The uh, uh, in especially in the commercial world, we're we're seeing a lot more need for cooling. Mm -hmm. And then you even see in big buildings, say in Anchorage, you might have cooling demand on one side of the building, the south side, and heating demand on the other side of the building at some times of the year. But from a residential perspective, uh, it's another reason I kind of like heat pumps, is they can do both cooling and heating. And uh, if you use a ground source heat pump, which is pretty expensive, mm -hmm. you know, then you're, you're basically trading heat in the ground. If you use an air source heat pump, it can also heat and cool. Bottom line is, if you make a really well insulated building, you reduce your demand for cooling and heating. Like people in Phoenix need insulation too, right? They just need to keep the heat out instead of in. So good walls, like, you know, the standard wall insulation is supposed to be like R21. That's nowhere near enough. We need to have buildings that are like R50. And we have, you know, we have several net zero homes in Alaska and, or what we call zero energy ready or zero energy homes. And several of them are heated with heat pumps. Uh, and typically they just have really thick walls, really good air sealing. And then they have such a low energy demand. We can, we can uh, fill that energy demand with a small device, wh whatever it is. Great, yeah. Um, had another question come up. I lost it. Does anybody else have any more questions to add to the discussion? Anything on Facebook, Melissa? No, I think that's all the Facebook questions. Um, Mark, I have a question. Do you think any of this uh, infrastructure stuff coming down out of DC is going to do any, um, have you seen any like targeted things people might want to hold off on or wait a couple more months to start with potential government funding maybe coming down for any efficiency things within, within homes? Well, well, I guess I wouldn't say I, there's enough detail yet to know how to target the practices, but there's some really good uh, 
indications that like for helping in changes in the electric power sector, et cetera, there's money in there to, uh, to, to do things like for utilities and whatnot. As far as individuals and homes, I don't think that infrastructure bill is so far from what I've seen and I'm not an expert in it, I haven't seen anything that would make me change my mind as to, you know, like hold off. In fact, it's a little bit of a pet peeve for those of us in the energy world because we we got to the point where sometimes we would talk about the cost of delay because people would say, I'm going to just wait until X, Y, Z is going to happen or, or, you know, and if you start to add up the energy costs while you're waiting, say, for some grant money to come through, which happens a lot in Alaska, waiting for that grant money, you could have gotten a loan and been saving a lot of money every year and paying a little bit on a loan and been money ahead. So, but, but to, to get to your question about the infrastructure bill, I don't know of specifics yet. One thing I'm hoping happens is we see an extension of the, some of the tax credits for solar and wind and things like that. Uh, we've already seen a little bit of a, a, a benefit in the solar tax credit. So if people are thinking about solar right now, you know, 26% off the cost of your system can't hardly beat that. I mean, we used to get 30%. But that's going to decline. So, uh, and and with these solarized campaigns that are around the state, you know, this is all good st stuff moving in the right direction. And I'm hoping that we can, through the infrastructure bill, I'm hoping we can see avenues that we can, you know, address electric utility needs on a community scale rather than an individual scale to uh, to clean up the grid. Great, and, and just with that segue, sorry, Margaret, I, I know I'm asking a lot of questions on your deal. Uh, just because you have talked about the utility a little bit, I know you are not here representing the utility in this role tonight at all, um, but just as a person who is also on the board and knows a lot about the utility, are there things that people can do um, from that kind of organizing perspective around energy efficiency or, or making sure that that is an option within the rail system in, in the Matsu? or else in other utilities as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the main things is, you know, talk to your board members. I mean, you'd be surprised how little we hear from our members. I mean, we do, our staff does a great job doing a survey every year. And, and for, I think, at least five years, they've been asking our member owners, I'm sorry, this is Matt Nuska Electric member owners, you know, what they, they've been asking them questions and it's not our staff, it's a professional survey developer asking about things like clean energy, et cetera. And the large majority, well over 70%, actually nearing 80% now say they want more renewable energy. But I think one of the most effective things you can do is contact the board. And one thing would be to say, look, when you're thinking about maybe another hydro project, which I'm all for hydro, don't get me wrong, um, but what are you doing to also think about reducing demand? And, you know, so, and, and, uh, the efficiency side often gets lost. So we can, I think people need to be active in their, in their utility and you'd be surprised how few people really do make comments. So yeah, way, I like small hydro by the way, but anyway. Okay. I was about to interject. So I think you mean small hydro. <laughs> Not and you know, man. along those lines, uh, another group that I deal with Alaska Center for Appropriate Technology I think in October, we're gonna have a guy named Dave Braley who just built that recent uh, small hydro in Eagle River area as a speaker. So I can let you know about that, but uh, the Juniper Creek hydro that just came online. Great, we will be having a talk with him as well on October 20th at 6 p.m. Oh. So if folks are interested in that, he will be speaking to us as well. Yeah. Very good, that's good to know. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited to hear And then that. just not, and then just to piggyback to you, and I'll stop with the election with the MEA because I know this is not the part, but just for folks who are listening, the MEA elections, you know, SRC is involved in that. And there will be another round of elections in the spring. Um, so just so people know that they'll, that will be more uh, coming up in, in the springtime from SRC and there'll be more opportunities around that. Um, some of this other, other information we will be learning throughout the year. And there's one, uh, I think there's a seat in Eagle River and an at-large seat that are up this spring. Great. Yes. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. 
So one, one question I've always had is, um, in a lot of rural areas, there aren't any real building codes. And so how does that, if, if we're looking at MEA, for example, and it doesn't have to be MEA, it can be, if you're looking at a utility co-op, how do they then help promote energy efficiency of individual homes when there's not necessarily a building standard? Or, or how can communities support folks when there isn't that standard? You know, there, it's a little tough. There, there is legislation that has already passed at the state level that allows what we call uh, uh, on-bill financing. So in other words, where this happens in other places, the electric company says, okay, we will help people do either efficiency improvements or renewable energy. In other words, they become basically the bank. And it's a big decision, you know, as a, as a director of a co-op, do I want my co-op to be a bank? Well, we're gonna have that discussion, of course, but some places, I think Chugach Electric is kind of starting to consider it. Other places in the lower 48 have already gone down this path, but the whole point is they help you with that upfront cost of whatever improvement you wanna make, whether it's efficiency or on the renewable side, and then you pay it off as part of your electric bill. So that's called on-bill financing. That's a possibility. The state has already said that's allowed in the state of Alaska. The, in other words, the legislation passed to allow that. Another one is called property assessed clean energy, PACE. We all call it PACE. And at the state level, we the, the state has passed what we call commercial PACE, which so property assessed clean energy. Uh, it's, it's again, it's a way to help property owners with that upfront cost, but it hasn't passed, the legislation, enabling legislation hasn't passed for residential systems. It's only passed for commercial systems. And so those are two types of legislation. Other than that, I mean, uh, it depends if your particular electric utility is a cooperative versus you know privately owned. And then I think in a lot of cases, I mean, I know the state of Alaska, or let's put it this way, Alaska Housing Finance Corporation has wanted a statewide building code for quite some time. We don't have one, but one thing to keep in mind is that uh, banks often enforce codes. So if you don't build properly and then you go to sell your house, it can't be financed unless it's built properly. So that's typically not, I mean, energy codes are a little bit different of an animal in the whole building code world. But building codes tend to be like the minimum and they're never hardly ever stringent enough. So I always encourage people to go beyond code and look for the value there as far as energy savings to yourself. But it's difficult, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, not an easy road yet. I don't know if that answers your question. I think it does. Yeah. I, I like, I'd never heard of the PACE before. So that was an interesting, I'm going to have to look into that. Yeah. And you'll hear, you'll hear the acronym CPACE and RPACE, residential and commercial. Great. Mark, do you have anything else to add to kind of wrap up? And uh, I don't think so. If anybody is interested in classes, you, you've got my email right there. I guess it was on the screen. I'm looking at a different screen that still has it on there for some reason. Um, no, I would just say, you know, the more awareness, it's always great. And I appreciate people asking great questions. And uh, don't be shy about contacting me if you have questions about energy or if you're, you know, the, the network of clean energy people in Alaska is relatively small. So we are connected to each other and we can, we can help out. Yeah. Well, thank you so much again oh. For, oh, for taking the time to be here today. Really appreciate you making the time in your busy schedule. And it was a great talk. Really happy to have you and great to, great to hear a lecture from you. It was great. Well, thanks a lot, Margaret. Thanks for the invitation, and I appreciate it. And thanks, everybody. I don't know. I wish I could see everybody's face, but uh, thanks, everybody, and have a good evening and enjoy the fall and be safe out there. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Melissa. Bye.
Okay, we're just stopping these recordings here. It'll take us just a minute.